Well, thank you, Dr. Patty Lather, for agreeing to be part of this symposium, at least in a recorded mm -hmm. fashion. Mm -hmm. Virtually. Virtually. The symposium is entitled Public Engagement and the Politics of Evidence in an Age of Neoliberalism and Audit Culture. Uh, it's a real honor to have you here. As you know, Dr. Patty Lather has been the author of many books, including this one that I especially like, Engaging Science. Policy from the side of the messy. And you like it because it's a small book. I, I like that. That's one part of it, but I also like the way it deals with the, the subject matter. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, I can tell you, too, that your work has meant so much to me in terms of, uh, I think we talked about it a bit earlier, and learning that it's okay to transgress. And it's a lesson that I've carried forward. You can find forward. a place. You can find a place, and that uh, validity is a challengeable term and concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's really stuck with me, mm -hmm. and so I appreciate it, and thanks so much for your work. I guess what I'd uh, be curious to know about is, over the course of your career, what kind of changes have you seen to scholarship, and maybe how scholarship is measured and assessed? Um, I'm thinking also of impact factors mm -hmm. and rankings mm -hmm. and league tables from the British system. I was going to say, we don't do that We'd yet. Does Canada? No, uh, not here, not here anyway, but I'd, it's coming. It's I, coming. It's, There's a feeling know, it's the coming. The conversations are out there. Well, um, I, I, I think this is very related to the second part of your question in terms of what scholarship counts. Because uh, certainly over my career at the front end, it was refereed journal articles. And there was a, an agreed upon sense of which journals mattered more than others, but it was not mathematized. Um, and then, the, as I, I came in through a kind of feminist push that had a big commitment to uh, useful work in the world. And came to the conclusion in terms of my own career that I had to be able to do both. Uh, work that counted within the traditional academic uh, criteria and work that counted within the feminist push mm -hmm. for an ethics of engagement and usefulness. And so you kind of had to be by, by about it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And that meant you had to master the traditional forms, which, you know, wasn't the easiest thing in the world, but I kind of took to it like a duck to water. I remember writing the research as praxis piece. That was deeply pleasurable to cruise across all those literatures and see those trends and patterns and pull them together and name them and, and feel like you were making quite a, contribution that would in fact open doors up for um, a bridge between this traditional and the, the more advocacy. Because as a feminist, the work I was doing was challenged as to even be scholarship. You could not do advocacy research. Or what did I call it? Openly ideological. Um, it was one guy told me at a conference. He said, "That's an oxymoron. Feminist work is is openly political. Research is objective. So it's an oxymoron to have feminist research." <laughs> so he treated research as an objective. Oh, definitely separate you know, from positivism the at that time. This was the late '70s and early '80s. Positivism had started to be challenged, but just around the corners. And so he felt perfectly strong in making that determination. See, and I think anyway, the, let me let me yeah, finish yeah, that thought. Yeah. It became very clear to me at that moment, and that was when I was still a doctoral student at my very first conference presentation, when he challenged me from the floor, that in order to go forward with the kind of work I wanted to do, I would have to challenge uh, science and validity and what knowledge counted. That that would be at the essence of the the legitimation of this more openly advocacy-based kind of work. Sure, and, and when I hear the different historical accounts of these times mm -hmm. and the paradigm wars, let's say, what I think that the time we're entering now is slightly different where it's not 
academics having arguments with academics so much mm -hmm. as maybe policymakers and uh, accountants almost <laughs> sort of uh, tabulating by Who an Who are algorithm. those accountants? Our, our administrators? Well, the people who rank universities? Th yeah, that kind of thing, I think. The rankings of universities and then also, um, like our university undergoes an audit where the finance department of the government says we want to see impact of research. And, mm, uh, here's how by we, which they mean? D journal impact factor, mm -hmm. I think. Or maybe research Grant dollars. monies, I was going to say yeah. that's usually what matters these days. How much grant money are you bringing in? So I think that that's a different kind of dialectic. When, when, you, when the paradigms were going on, I, I think at least you were arguing against another you know, other academics in a paradigm, or at least that's how I think of it. I don't no, know. I think you're right. I think at that time what mattered was, I'm, I'm thinking, a very traditional sense of scholarly uh, worthiness. And it didn't have, grants came in later. This whole thing of measuring one's uh, productivity by external funding, that was, that was not in the cards when I was first starting. And this, um, Mathematizing of uh, scholarly impact, that's pretty new. That's new. And we can blame the Brits, I think. Yeah. For that. And that's where those league tables come in. Yes. I think, and, uh, yes. REF. And my vague understanding, as we were talking the other night, was that some of that came out of medicine. Right. And the Cochrane Initiative that in Britain, and the need to. Now here I'm going to get on a little fuzzy ground, but the need to warrant the National Health Service that Britain has by showing outcome measures and which treatments worked and which ones didn't and where they were going to put the money and where they weren't. And so they, it just you know, kind of grew up this idea of these measurable outcomes. But it seems to me it's a kind of applying the market forces to things that are maybe curiosity driven or, or oh, you, yeah, you know, what it, the, how it works to put that into scholarship is right. its own mismatch, to say the least. But I think the larger issue is neoliberalism here and the need for governments to, uh, well, cut back on the money they spend on public services mm -hmm. and be able to warrant those cutbacks and be able to say this is worthy and that is not worthy, or this is working, you know, what works, clearing house, this works and that does not. Uh, and so they're desperately trying to measure everything that moves so that they can make these, you know, the economics in the last instance, That's right. these economic decisions, to a public that's also going through a very broad-based legitimation crisis. It's sort of like, what do you give authority to? If you've got a government saying this is worthy and that's not worthy, that government better be able to back that up with something that's going to, in a very a time when every authority is being questioned, uh, you better have something to, that at least looks solid. And numbers look about as solid as anything we've got. And so you try to come up with numbers for everything. Even though that's an inadequate system, I think we'd all agree. Mismatch. The house of cards. Or house of cards is a good way to look at it, I think, yeah. Now, some of this is, that, you know, there's some encouraging things with the parents refusing of the tasks, although I think there's, that's a multimodal all sorts of reasons going in there. I saw an article the other day that they're starting to ask questions of the law board exam. Oh, right. Now there's an edifice <laughs> that had an awful lot of authority that's now getting questions questioned from on high by deans of law schools. Again, it's multimodal why those questions are coming in. They're not all innocent by any means. The loss of law students. Mm -hmm the empty chairs in, in yeah. law schools these days, and so the, quote, lowering of standards of admission, hmm. and, and then people are doing less well on the law, law board's exams, so then the questions are being asked of the exam itself. Right. I, switching gears a bit, I, I'm wondering if you've had thoughts about the importance of the public intellectual or 
public engaged work to society, what, what we do here at the academy in, in higher We learning. are, I mean, except for those of us who work in private schools, and I would say, that, and I've never really believed that they're not, they don't get some benefits from public tax monies as well. But we are a publicly supported institution and there should be some payback. And it's not just the education of the children, of the folks who are paying the bills, but there's all this that we do in the name of research should have some usefulness. Now I think you can talk to the cows come home about what it means to be of use. Right. And that is not a, an easy, it's a deeply philosophical and full of landmines kind of question. And I think sometimes the pressure, like we had somebody come to speak at Ohio State one time, they were talking about you know, whether you can help us figure out how to get more milk from cows and, you know, this is the kind of academic research we want and what kind of wheat we're supposed to grow so we can get three crops out of it instead of two. Now those sorts of applications, there's a long-running debate in the academy in terms of pure science and applied science and we don't want to forget that and fall into an applied science box where the experimentation and play with ideas and sometimes those things in down the road end up having uses that you'd never think of and so somehow balancing that applied versus pure and the responsibility I think I like the word responsibility quite I think we all have responsibility to social responsibilities. And yet again, that can be real dangerous too, because uh, I think I've written about Foucault's cautions about being the master of truth and justice and the great liberator come to liberate. And one of my very first research projects was on the sins of imposition we create in the name of liberation. And that was in the introductory women's studies classroom. Right. where you're trying to turn everybody into a little feminist just like <laughs> you. And there's a kind of mind washing that can happen on the left as well as on the right. Well, I think the more doubtful I become as someone claims to truth become louder, I think, well, wait a minute here. Mm -hmm. you know, Suspicious behavior. Yeah, that's, yeah, let's give it some extra scrutiny. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, I think some of that, uh, the responsibility of, of, uh, of the academic has transformed what I see anyway as um, a greater inclination to community engaged scholarship and and more uh, recently perhaps indigenous epistemologies where uh, First Nations people are doing research for themselves mm -hmm. by themselves mm -hmm. and, and uh, being sort of not the object of study anymore but mm -hmm. I, I, I find that maybe some of that is imperiled again by uh, the audit culture that what counts, what counts and what will be measured. And how to count. You betcha. Very parallel to the early feminist work where the idea that you could uh, have uh, these usefulnesses um, as legitimate knowledge production, advocacy, advocacy work or identity based work, whatever you want to call it. I think that we have to decide if you want to have a multi-cultural, uh, I don't know if that word still used anymore, uh, faculty, for example, and student body and serve the needs of a diverse yeah. student body, um, the single standard is such a uh, winnowing exclusionary, uh, blunt object, that something's got to give in that uh, formulation. Sure, I think those are important. I, I think some interesting work can, and, and I would guess is happening, was say how, how to take like community-based, committed engagement work and not necessarily fit it into the algorithms of the league tables, but come up with some 
I mean, I, I've long, I always say validity's been very, very good to me in my career, come up with some kind of an articulation of criteria that do justice to those practices, but that is translatable into some of this accountability. I mean, it, I'm not against accountability. Mm. I'm against measurement mania. Sure. The reduction of accountability to measurement mania. So what would an accountability system look like that would do justice to community-based research and have criteria that are not foreign to it? Well, I, I've often thought about that a bit, like if there was a, a parallel maybe to the journal impact factors that people seem mm -hmm. to... Uh, they love them because they're, they have the illusion of precision yeah. and, and they're pretty easy to deal with. But maybe some kind of community impact factor, there wouldn't be a number, but something like, uh, well, even letters from the community that say, well, this, this research has been so important to us as a community here. Well... But everything you're saying, Mark, would be hard. That's hard to deal with. You're right. How do I know you didn't take that person out for dinner and then they wrote a nice letter? You know, everything gets all caught up in bias and, yeah. and uh, except, except numbers do too, of course, for those yeah. of us who know how numbers work. But numbers somehow have the appearance of, yeah. of being above all that. Sort of cloaked in objectivity. Cloaked in objectivity, yeah. So I think that's sort of the the stuck point of, uh, I mean, I think you're familiar, you're familiar with that piece of mine in 93 on validity and post-structuralism, and I have that checklist in there, yeah. and when I wrote that checklist, I went back and I abstracted out of my own writing in that article what those, those four kinds of validity, and I think there's four or five items yeah. uh, in each one of them, and I very deliberately put a place that you could write a check mark. <laughs> and I thought, wouldn't this be fun? It's almost as a kind of comic routine where you'd be going through, you'd have a student's dissertation defense, and you'd go, uh, were they purposefully uh, multiple in their interpretive uh, edifices or something? And then you go, check. <laughs> <laughs> and then with the voluptuous validity, you know, was there an embodied sense of the researcher brought to bear on the findings? Check. And, and check, 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 check. And I meant that as a joke this idea that you could reduce these things, these concepts, to check marks. But I did hear that some people were using, some advisors were in fact right. using it that That's way. like the rubrification, you became a rubric. Rubrification, it did become a rubric, yeah. <laughs> um, and as you look back over your career, um, do, do you see, or what do you see as sort of the greatest threats or challenges to the academy? What, what would be your, maybe, your warnings? Warnings? Or maybe you want to take it a different way. What advice would you leave to a young scholar? Well, it, it, the advice always feels so banal, you know, in a way. It's just like follow your yeah. passion. And uh, it, it's a, a, even a 20, I always told my students, start later. Don't be in any big hurry. <laughs> Stay as a student as long as you can and learn as much as you can because even a 20, 20 years of this is almost enough. Right. And 30 and 40, they'll, they'll just <laughs> do you in, you know. So pace yourself accordingly. And um, if you're going to do that 20 or 30 years, you better love what you're doing. It's not just a job. It's it, Everybody's got their story about what it means to sit down and write but you've got to be internally motivated for that to happen and, and with the patty lather lighthouse what what would be the rocks in the academic sea i guess what would I'm you see as following your what, metaphor what, 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 would, what, what would be your warnings i oh, guess warning. like, with your, if you were the lighthouse the things that could uh you know set kill us off the ship yeah, yeah kill the good ship the good ship lollipop okay. Well, you know, I, I, another banal answer would be distance education and the computerization of the teacher and the... But I think we'll figure ways out around that. Um, using the internet to enhance and deepen and open up. I think that... Uh, 
unlike public school, where I really worry that we're driving good teachers out of the business. I have a black friend who said, no wonder you white people keep these jobs a secret, the professorials. <laughs> They're really good jobs. <laughs> so, you know, in a way, I'm not worried about people being able to keep a professoriate lineage coming along and being, being part of the continuation. And they'll, you know, every generation's job is to shock the ones that came before and do something that's kind of out of the box. Mm -hmm. I have some faith that they will <laughs> continue to do that. So I'm, I'm much less worried about higher ed than I am about K through 12. K through 12. There's, there's some troubles for the future. Well, there's a different kind of auditing going on there too, right? Mm -hmm. The standardized testing. Mm -hmm. Same kind of uh, thinking. Oh, it's the same, same logic. Same yeah. logic. Yeah. It's just that public school teachers have never had the autonomy. Never. I mean, there was a brief shining period when, I don't know when it was, like from 1962 to 1963 or something, where teachers actually could make their own curriculums and, and, uh, and creativity with kids in classrooms flourished in some places. It was uneven, of course. But boy, that got nipped in the bud. <laughs> but I think that's still, I, I, maybe I do have one, word, I guess if you saw this logic, this neoliberal logic extended into higher ed, there's always talk, and Obama's no different than any of the rest of them, of bringing those sorts of rubrics to higher ed, <laughs> that they're going to start having you know, national curriculums for higher ed. Oh. And if parents are going to spend all that money on their kids going through college, they should have guaranteed knowledge base and learning objectives and, you know, that same wacky thinking. There's an erosion of academic freedom. It could be, yeah. yeah. And what would, you, would you, what would you conclude with if we, if we were concluding this, this interview? What, what would you leave on? A final thought. <laughs> Not to put any pressure. <laughs> My final thought. Well, let me talk about research as opposed to teaching for a minute. Um, I don't know there. I think there could be some bigger changes a borning that um, the kinds of pressures, you know, for getting tenure and the, the madness of the system that we have could start shifting around enough. Someone told me one time that tenure is a million dollar deal. If you tenure someone, you're basically giving, if they stay with you, the career. you will be paying them at least a million dollars over their career. So we do want to, you don't want to just tenure anybody and everybody. But on the other hand, the, the hoops that we make people jump through are not necessarily, let me use the word valid. I mean, they're not necessarily tied to what it means to be a good teacher, be a good colleague, be a good uh, researcher even. They're just habits that we've fallen into and somewhat measurable uh, items and cause many uh, anguish. And um, I think I also read one time that the most divorces were from people going up for, in higher it's, ed. Well, it is it definitely people going up for ten years. Stressful time. It's a very stressful time. So whatever it would mean to have um, criteria and even probationary periods, I'm all right with all of that. But that they'd be somehow more tied to the actual work of a of a career and and the quality because God knows I what I see is people get tenure and then they burn out and you've got the kind of um, perpetual associate syndrome where people they're too they, they whatever love they might have had for research is gone by the time they get tenure they and they, they you know, turned all that out but now they're burned out so they don't 
there's no more productive scholar left in them. I wonder if some of that is not just uh, the perversion of the publisher parish, uh, where the you know having ten articles is, that say little is better than one or two very profound articles. And I've seen that too. Yeah. But what's a very profound article? And well, I guess that's to up to our, our colleagues to yeah. decide and people to take up and, and use. Yeah. But Interpretation. So, it's so usually it used to mean, in my day, it meant you went to, I can't remember what that was even called, where they counted citations. And you had to have a citational port, uh, profile. Right. Mm -hmm. No, I think they still, the impact so factors still, are part that, of that, right? I uh, think I suppose, the, yeah. how often are they cited and by whom and in what journals. Weighted, and, howly. Yeah, the, <laughs> the great algorithms. Of, mm -hmm. But I think all of those things also end up uh, usurping the collegial governance structure that, like, in so, somewhat I think we decide if, if you're uh, passing to tenure by your colleagues need a review committee decides mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, I think that if we put it down to an algorithm you no longer need humans to interpret this thing or you know you could just have a computer do it you have a one point well and i've and seen i've seen folks that'd be happy to have a computer do it because they feel like there's so much uh impressionistic yes i like that person no i don't mm -hmm. like that person going on that they just tell me what the criteria are, and I'll I'll do I'll produce whatever it is that says I must produce, and then I want to guarantee that, that then I'll get my tenure. Yeah, it don't work that way either, does it? it does Yeah. <laughs> so I I don't have certainly don't have any solutions. I do know that the system we've got now, by and large, is some mix of inhumane and um, dysfunctional, and actually thwarts this idea of producing people who will stay active scholars over a career, which is certainly what you want. Mm. Well. So there. I, I think that's a great place to end right there. <laughs>